All right, a few years ago, our son Luke invited his friend Rami uh, that he had met at Portland State who uh, grew up in Saudi Arabia, and he invited him to a Christmas Eve service and then to our house for dinner. After dinner, we were moving into our living room, and uh, our family was gathering to open a few presents, and Rami asked me, he turned to me, he says, what do Christians believe? He grew up a Muslim and seriously didn't really have any clue. Well, the family was gathering, and so I only had a few minutes. What could I tell him that Christians believe? I mean, what would you say if you only had a few minutes to summarize the Christian faith? So I'd like you to turn to somebody next to you, uh, maybe groups of two or groups of three. Kind of look around so nobody's left out. If you only had a few minutes, what would you say are the key things that Christians believe? Go. You only get a minute. Look around so nobody's left out. Okay, let's come back together. Today, I am beginning a new series of messages called Christianity 101. Now, your initial response might be, yawn. You say, hey, come on. I've been a Christian for a, a little bit. I don't want a 101 class. But this isn't just any 101 class. You know how when you go to college, you find out certain professors are excellent and you want to take every class you can from them? Well, this class will be taught by the Apostle Paul, his explanation of the Christian faith through the book of Romans. Jesus Christ shared the gospel with Jews. Paul was tapped by Christ to share the good news with Gentiles, non-Jews. And as he did so, Jews who became Christians felt like he was perverting the gospel because he wasn't telling them to keep the law, like circumcision and food laws. And, uh, and Gentiles, they knew, Apostle Paul told them, you don't have to keep the law. This, you're saved by God's grace, by your faith. And so Gentiles actually looked down their noses at Jewish Christians as being weaker Christians because they felt like they had to keep the law. So Paul writes the book of Romans to show everyone that his message is the same as the Jerusalem apostles, the Jewish Christian apostles. Uh, and in the process of doing that, he single-handedly synthesized Jewish, Greek, and Roman thought. His work is so amazing that many scholars describe him as one of the ten greatest minds in history. So I'd like to read the first 17 verses of Romans. If you'd like to follow along, we have Bibles under the seats. Uh, it's going to be on page 1,126. In his introduction to this book, Paul gives us an overview of what Christians believe. And in honor of God's word, I'd like you to stand. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. Now, Paul has never been to Rome, so he feels like he needs to introduce his credentials as an apostle. In order to be an apostle, you have to be commissioned by Jesus Christ. You have to be an eyewitness of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And you have to be sent out with the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul received all of that on the road to Damascus and set apart for the gospel of God. Paul calls it the gospel of God. This is uh, a God-initiated message. We're not just dealing with human speculation, just one more religion among many. This is the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Christian faith is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. Regarding his son, who as to his earthly life 
was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. The central content of the gospel is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul does not mean that he was appointed to be the Son of God at his resurrection. He was the Son of God from eternity. He means that the resurrection was the transition from Jesus being the Son of God in lowliness and meekness to being the Son of God in power. Verse 5. Through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his namesake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. This is Paul's imprint. He he uses this sentence in every one of his New Testament books. Uh, We all have an imprint when we write letters. Our typical imprint for us on our emails or texts is, sorry I've been so slow in getting back to you. Verse 8, first I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his son is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last by God's will the way may be open for me to come to you. As you read through Paul's letters, one thing you learn is that he prays a lot for people. The reason the church in Rome was a great church, one of the reasons is because of Paul's prayers for them. I'm convinced that today, the greatest churches in the world, the reason they're great is because the prayers of its people. I hope you take time uh, during the week to pray for me, pray for our staff, pray for our leaders. Verse 11, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong, that is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. When we come to worship, we encourage each other. Maybe there's something I say that encourages you. Me seeing you here encourages me. Verse 13, I do not want you to be unaware Brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but I've been prevented from doing so until now. In order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I've had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. Now, in two of the greatest verses in all the Bible, Paul sums up the Christian faith. And he's going to uh, elaborate on this throughout the rest of the book of Romans. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Lord Jesus, thank you for your gospel. And we want to hear from you what that is this morning. So it'd be very clear to us. And we just open our lives up to you for the next 25 minutes. Speak to us. We're ready to listen. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As you read Romans 1.16, aren't you surprised that Paul begins his book with the negative word, ashamed. He says he's not ashamed of the gospel. If Paul's trying to write a persuasive document, why does he start negatively? Obviously, he's never taken a Dale Carnegie class. I mean, if you're trying to sell your house, you don't say, even though I did the wiring myself, it works just fine. I mean, why bring it up? The buyer would have never thought of it. Paul says, I'm not embarrassed by the gospel. Why bring up the possibility of being embarrassed? Uh, Three Sundays ago, August 19th, I was embarrassed. You folks are generous in giving me time away to study and prepare for the year. uh, But it comes with an expectation. You expect me to come back physically, emotionally, and spiritually, you know, revved up and amped up and ready to lead the church through the year. 
And Saturday night, 5 p.m., I went out on our back deck, climbed up too high on a ladder, and I fell, and I broke my wrist. I spent all Saturday night at St. Vincent's Hospital. You know, I was embarrassed that I came back looking like this. Paul says he's not embarrassed. And the reason I think he brings up the word of being ashamed is because he realizes the idea of us having to accept Christ's death on the cross in order to be saved is foolishness to many people because it undermines self-righteousness. The idea that there's something we can do to earn our way into God's favor. I can think of five, four reasons why you might be ashamed of the gospel. If you're not a Christian, this could be, these, one of these could be a reason you're not a follower of Christ. One, would, we would be ashamed if the gospel were not true. No matter how nice the words might sound, we'd be ashamed if the gospel was not true. The gospel is all based, uh, it hinges on the belief that Jesus was raised from the dead. If we knew that was false, then we'd want to get people quickly to, to sign up for the faith and, and we wouldn't want them to read the fine print because we'd be embarrassed because we knew it wasn't true. Second, we'd be ashamed if the gospel were powerless. Even if it were true, what if it had no power? Though it might be true, it wouldn't mean anything. It couldn't change anything. Again, we'd be ashamed if the gospel were not for everyone. You'd be ashamed if you were discussing uh, things and laughing with your friends and you're talking about faith and, and some, a stranger comes up and says, I like that. I want that too. And then you'd have to say, oh, I'm sorry. This, isn't, this is just for us. It's not for you. You'd be ashamed. Fourth, we would be ashamed if the gospel were not good. Maybe true, but the effect on our lives is negative. We'd be afraid to share the truth with people because once they embraced it, it would be hurtful to them. It may claim to be good, but what if when you got involved, you found it was poisonous? This happens with many religions and cults. I have a cousin who became friends with some members of Sun Moon's Unification Church. And she got more and more involved so that she totally embraced their beliefs. And she got married at a Unification Church wedding in New York City. And I can assure you, as a result of that, her life got worse. It did not help her. It was not good for her. Uh, we'd be embarrassed if once people joined the church, it wasn't good for them. Now back to our friend Rami, our Saudi Arabian friend. How could I... How could you summarize the Christian faith in a few minutes? Paul says he's not ashamed of the gospel. He lists four reasons we need not be ashamed of the gospel. Parents, write these down and discuss them with your children. Whether you're an empty nester, a young married, a single person, or a teenager, you do not need to be ashamed of the gospel. Here are four reasons, four things as you go around among your classmates and coworkers and neighbors and family members that you don't need to be ashamed of the gospel. Four things you could share if you just had a few minutes to tell them what is Christian faith. First, we don't need to be ashamed of the gospel because it is true. Paul begins in verse 1 by stating that the gospel is the gospel of of God. It's true because God does not lie. We live in a pluralistic society in which it's assumed that no belief is fully true. Every, every belief is, they're all ba basically equivalent. So they're partly true, partly false. Uh, Jesus Christ was a great man, but so was Muhammad, Confucius, Krishna, Marx, this is the antithesis of the thinking of the writers of the New Testament. The early believers were convinced the gospel of Jesus Christ was true, and it alone was the truth. Paul writes, God who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, 
the man Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is the only way, he declares, that you can get to God the Father. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father except through me. He claims to be the truth and the only way to God. Matthew summarizes the truth of the gospel in Matthew 27, 45. Jesus was dying on the cross. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. It was dark at noon. Every sin in the history of the world was on Jesus Christ. You cannot get to God with your sin. You say, I'm trying to do the best I can. Nobody does the best they can. A Gallup poll in 2016 asked, will you go to heaven? By what will you go? 75% said, 75 said by keeping the Ten Commandments. We watched breathlessly this summer as 14 Thai students were trapped in a cave in Thailand. All of them got out except one. What if 75% of them had said, we're going to swim our way out? That wouldn't work. They had to be rescued. And Jesus died on the cross to rescue us. 20, Matthew 27, 51. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The curtain that metaphorically separated us from God was torn from top to bottom. As the high priest rose to, to kill the goat that would provide the sacrifice for all the Jews, just as he was ready to, to do it, the curtain was torn from top to bottom, symbolizing that the breakthrough had been won by Jesus Christ's death on the cross. We have access to God now through Jesus Christ dying for our sins. Matthew goes on, the earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. There was an earthquake, bodies were raised from the dead. I mean, something big happened. In verse 54, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. The gospel is based on God's word. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The Christian faith is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. Peter says in 2 Peter, the book uh, Chris preached on this summer, above all you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture ever came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For no prophecy had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. All that we read in the Bible is true because it's inspired by God. The Bible is not a collection of fairy tales written by human beings, as my college English professor said, but it's true. It's written by God. The second reason we do not need to be ashamed of the gospel is because the gospel is powerful. Paul writes, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God. He uses the Greek word dunamis. We get our word uh, dynamic from that. Christ won the victory over sin, death, and Satan through his resurrection. Because of that decisive victory, if we embrace Christ, now we have his power over sin. Power is part of the attraction of the gospel. Paul Eshelman, in his book, I Just Saw Jesus, tells about the movie Jesus, which is the life of Matthew, uh, the life of Jesus according to Matthew, and it's been produced by Campus Crusade for Christ. They've uh, translated it into all kinds of languages around the world. So people gather who've probably never seen a movie in their language. And so everybody comes out, they're fascinated. And so they were in Thailand, and they uh, showed the, the film there, and it got late, and um, they thought it wouldn't be safe to, to, to drive home after, you know, in the dark, and so they decided to spend the night there. They thought even though they hadn't been warmly received, surely they would give them a, a safe place to stay. And so they said, yeah, you can stay in the Buddhist temple. What they didn't tell them is the temple was known for miles around for being inhabited by demons. Demons. 
Everybody who had stayed there before had been driven out or killed. So they, not knowing that, they bedded down and, and they all went to sleep. And about an hour they were all later, they were all awakened by this image of this hideous beast in the corner. It was the most terrifying thing they'd ever seen. And one of the team members says, let's do what Jesus did. Let's drive him out in the name of Jesus. And so they prayed. And when they felt like it was clear that the demons had been driven out and no longer had power, they went to sleep. Well, the next morning, the tie came to collect their equipment, assuming they would have been driven out in the middle of the night or put to death, and they were all sleeping there peacefully. And at that moment, they realized the power of Jesus, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ has power. And many of them came to faith. Christians have power. Our strength comes not from ourselves, but from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ provides us with power over sin. We don't have to fall to every temptation that comes across our path. The third reason we do not need to be ashamed of the gospel is because the gospel is for everyone. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. A right relationship with God is available to every human being on this planet. It's just as available to, to Rami from Saudi Arabia as it is to our children. Fourth reason we do not need to be ashamed of the gospel is because the gospel is good. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. This verse was instrumental uh, in the transformation of Martin Luther's faith. In 1505, he became a monk. And he wrote, if ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, it was I. But even though he was a, a great monk and very dedicated to God, he felt an anguish of being separated from God. And when he read this verse, he wondered what the righteousness of God referred to. He assumed that it, it meant, you know, a holy, righteous God uh, showing judgment and punishment on unholy human beings. But once he came to realize that the righteousness of God was God's goodness and mercy, because of Christ's death on the cross, God could show mercy to us. And then it transformed his thinking from a God being a cruel and mean God into God being a merciful and kind God. God is both just, he's holy, and justifier. He maintains his high standard of justice and he justifies us through Christ's death on the cross so we can enter into God's presence. The gospel is good because it reveals the goodness of God. God allows us to start over with a clean record. Our sin-stained past is not reckoned against us. He gives us the Holy Spirit so we have the power to live a life that pleases him. Brian Stevenson is a lawyer uh, and director of the Equal Justice Initiative. He spoke two years ago at the Global Leadership Summit that Jory and I try to attend every summer in Chicago. And in a TED Talk, he talked about his grandmother. Um, his grandmother's parents were slaves, and uh, uh, it had a huge impact on their lives. And his grandmother had 10 children, and uh, so it was always hard for Brian to get time with his uh, grandma. And so one day the family's all gathered around, and there's kids running all over the place, and he was like nine years old. His grandma looked across at him in the room, and she walked over to him. He says, Brian, we got to talk. So she took him outside, and she says, Brian, I've been watching you, and I think you can do anything you want to do in this life. I think you're a very special person. But I want to ask you to do three things. First of all, I want to ask that you will always love your mother. She's my baby girl, and I want you to promise me you'll take care of her. Well, Brian loved his mother. That was no problem. He says, yes, Mama. She says, second, I want to ask that you always do the right thing, even if it's the hard thing. Brian thought, well, that sounds fine. So he said, yes, Mama. Third thing I want you to ask you to do is that you never drink alcohol. Well, Brian was only nine. He thought, okay, yes, Mama. Mama. 
Well, a few years later, he was out in the woods with his older siblings, a couple of them, and they said, hey, Brian, have some beer. He said, ah, I don't feel good about that. His brother looked at him and said, what's the matter with you, Brian? Take some beer. Yeah. Then he looked at him again a little harder. He says, oh, are you still hung up on that grandma talk? She does that with all of us. She pulls us aside and said, you're very special. Well, Brian was at that point devastated. Then he lowered his voice and he said to the crowd, he said, he says, I'm 52 years old. I probably shouldn't tell you this because I know this talk's going to go out to millions of people around the world. But I've never had a drop of alcohol. He says, I don't tell you that because that, I think that's virtuous. The point is, is when somebody you revere in your life asks you to do something, you can do it. When you ask Jesus Christ into your life, he gives you the ability to do things you never thought possible. Paul goes on, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the just will live by faith. What does Paul mean by faith? Well, when referring to Christ, it refers to faithfulness. When referring to humans, it means trust. In this context, it's referring to Christ. We are saved by Christ's faithfulness. If our salvation depended on our faith, none of us could be secure. But our salvation is secured by his faithfulness. Right standing with God is, being, is accept, being, accepting him by faith. It's not by anything we've done that we've earned. If we admit that we can't do anything to earn God's favor, cry out for God's mercy, throw ourselves on his faithfulness, we find salvation. The word faith in Romans 1.17 also refers to human faith. The just shall live by their faith in Christ. The righteous save their lives not by works, but by faith. We're not saved by something we do, but by leaving, only Christ can save us. Now, putting these two meanings for faith together, Christians are those who by faith trust in the faithfulness of God. They recognize there's nothing they can do to save themselves, so they throw their whole weight on Christ's faithfulness. Have you ever put your whole weight on the faithfulness of Christ? In just a moment, you can pray and receive Christ. You do not need to be ashamed of the gospel, for it is true, powerful for everyone, and good. Lord Jesus, thank you for your gospel, your good news, that it is true and powerful. It's for everyone, and it's good. I want to give you a moment, every head bowed, if you've never invited Christ to forgive your sins, come into your life, you say, I've heard enough today. Jesus, I want you to come into my life. I believe that you're the Son of God and that you were raised from the dead. Please forgive my sins. If you feel like you've already done that, why don't you tell Christ that you're not ashamed of the gospel. As you go about your work this week, school, you're not gonna be ashamed because you know it's true and powerful and good and for everyone. Everybody pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming and dying for us and being raised from the dead so that we can have life and a relationship with God, meaning and purpose in life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.